light of the world. Hey, we're getting started with our service today. And as we do, we're opening with worship. Last week, we talked briefly in the beginning about how in the book of Deuteronomy, we see that part of worship is ministering to God. And, and very shortly, as we begin, I just wanna add some context to that. In Exodus, God asked the people to build a really fancy tent called a tabernacle. And he gave tons and tons of directions for how it should be done and for who is to do what work. And we tend to gloss over the start of the story and the reason why. We tend to think of the tabernacle and we go, yeah, holy place, got it. But why that building? Why did God want it to go with the Israelites in the first place? Simply put, Exodus 25, verse 8, God says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. He says more, but that's the crux of it, that I may dwell among them. He has always wanted to be near to us. And having a space and a place to worship is a big part of that. So let's a little loud. Let's declare our intention to use this space and this time to draw closer to him. Amen. Let's worship together.
about him now let's turn our attention vertically like the first song said Jesus you alone shall be my first love and then the second song reinforced that with many solid reasons why and now we fix our eyes again straight up to heaven we direct our focus onto God himself as we stand in recognition and celebration of the relationship we have together knowing God deepening that relationship over time. So sing with me. Celebrate with me. Remember with me.
Good to see everyone today. For those of you who are guests today, so glad to have you here worshiping with us. Our regular attenders, good to have you as well. For those of you who are watching us online, we are so very glad to have you as well. Um, before we get into the announcements and eventually the prayers, I'm going to have you do a slightly awkward thing since you're already seated, seated, seated. Uh, but uh, look around you, smile, wave, tell some folks good morning. Perfect. You know, it, it reminds me of like when you're in school and you're waving at people across the other side of the room, you know, a chunk of spit water or a crunched up piece of uh, paper or something. But uh, uh, certainly we got to get back to uh, just uh, talking to people and greeting people. So um, it's a little, uh, little weird or awkward to do it, but uh, we got to start somewhere. So I appreciate that. Um, if you don't mind letting us know that you are here this morning, both watching um, in person or if you're watching online, uh, you can go online and do that, or you can scan that QR code, and uh, we would very much appreciate knowing that you're worshiping with us uh, this morning. Um, just a few announcements uh, as we get started, too. Um, we have started now kids' ministry again during uh, early service, so um, we have, of course, been offering that all along in late service, but starting today, uh, that is available now uh, during um, early service. I want to highlight two events that are coming up in, in June. You know, it was really fun. I, hopefully, you guys were able to be here for our four Sunday fun days that we had been doing over the last four weeks. Uh, but we had, like, the snow cone, the, um, uh, the Mother's Day stuff, the kite festival, and I don't even remember the other one. But um, we got a couple things coming up in June. The first is this. On Father's Day, June 21st, we're going to have a Sunday fun day, but it is not an S-U-N-D-A-Y fun day. It is an S-U-N-D-A-E fun day. So if you come, this is a caveat, to late service on Father's Day, we're going to have set up in the cafe like four um, hot fudge Sunday stations. So um, we hope that you uh, will uh, join us for that as we celebrate dads on June 21st. Also, we've got a bunch of like guests that have been worshiping with us since we reopened. Some of those I know are uh, going to be going back to their church as uh, their church is reopened, but uh, some people may uh, potentially be staying as well. So I'd love an opportunity to get to know your family better. So if you are currently visiting Light of the World on June 28th, we're going to have a pizza with Pastor Greg time. And um, it'll be in the cafe and just be a kind of an opportunity for you to um, ask me any questions about the church, for me to kind of get to know you a little bit better. So uh, we hope that uh, any of our uh, new regular guests or old regular guests would join us for that, um, for that on June the 28th. Would you, uh, would you join me in a word of prayer this morning? Merciful Almighty God, we just um, we thank you to be able to come into your presence this morning. 
to this sanctuary, to this just um, moment of, um, of, of quietness in the midst of what's been a very um, crazy week. And as we come before you this morning, uh, gracious God, we, um, we all owe you a, a recognition that we've been, um, we've been unfaithful. And for that, we're sorry. We're, we've been unfaithful in how we've lived our lives, not only as individuals, but as a nation. We've been unfaithful to you in the lack of faith that we've shown, um, the lack of leadership that we've shown maybe in our families or in our community, um, and certainly even as the church, uh, there's been a lack of leadership during these days. We've been unfaithful in our lack of justice and our lack of integrity. We've been unfaithful in what we value and in what we're willing to speak up and defend. We deserve every bit the chaos that we've brought upon ourselves. And we just pray, gracious God, that as we are in this time of, um, of chaos, that um, it would lead to a time, time of pruning. In fact, your word tells us that as the later times approach, that it will be a time of pruning in which through difficulty, pruning is never pleasurable, but faith will be strengthened and the church will be restored. And so I just pray, gracious God, prune on. Just start of our sixth month into the year and people just muttering on what a difficult and horrible year it's been, but gracious God, as, as long as it takes to get our attention and to turn us back to you, just say, come Lord Jesus, and, and allow us to be stretched, allow us to be hurt, allow us to break, allow us to suffer, so that in the end we, we would turn back to you. And that in the end, in our weakness and in our sufferings, that we would find our strength in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the Scripture tells us that if we say we have no sin, we're actually deceiving ourselves and God's truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is merciful and he'll forgive us our sins and he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I ask you to stay in the presence of God and each other. Do you confess that you are a sinner and that you need God's forgiveness in your life? If so, say, I do so confess. I do so confess. Instead, and by the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I announce to you the forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. concluding our message series, Unshakable, this morning, and I have to tell you, I've, uh, I've really enjoyed the message series. It's been based off of James chapter 1, verse 12. It says this, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person then will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love Him. So what we've been talking about is the need to persevere as we go through life because life throws a lot of difficulties at us, and honestly, Satan throws a lot of difficulties at us as well. We talked about uh, persevering, uh, or we talked about having unshakable courage, we talked about having unshakable character, and we've talked about having unshakable patience. But you know what? I've saved the best for last because, you know what? Everything that, if we're going to be unshakable in, 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 in our courage and in, in our character and our patience, we've got to be unshakable in something called our faith. And so I want to, I want to talk with you about faith this morning, and I'm just going to be upfront and honest with you. Um, there's certain topics that I'm, I'm more passionate about than others, and, and this is one that, um, that I'm extremely passionate about. I, I, I could talk for hours and hours and hours on this, and, and, and my struggle is a little bit just even what to say in the time I have to say it this morning. 
um, but I'm, I'm really passionate about uh, the, the topic of faith, and here's why. Because the Bible says that without faith, you can't please God. The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, let me ask you, if it is impossible to please God apart from faith, then is there anything that we should be focusing on more in our life than faith and strengthening faith? But honestly, we don't talk about faith that much at church. Maybe, maybe a couple times a year. But if it's impossible to please God apart from it, is there anything more critical to, to our relationship with God than faith? What we do talk about in church often is knowledge of God, but what I'm here to tell you is that there's a big difference between knowing God and having faith. And I want to talk with you a little bit about it this morning. Because first and foremost, uh, faith is, um, and I don't really know how to say it, so just excuse my, my word choice if it's not perfect, but um, faith is the most powerful force in the universe next to God himself. How is that? Well, because if you think about it in the spiritual realm, there's nothing more powerful than faith because there's no other way that a person is to be saved. We're saved by grace through faith, right? So without faith, you and I will never spend eternity with God in heaven. There's nothing more powerful in the spiritual realm than faith. But that's not just true of the spiritual realm. It's actually true in the physical realm. If you think of, of all the, the power that there is in the physical world, there's nothing more powerful. There's no bomb. There's no atomic bomb. There's no laser. There's nothing more powerful than faith. This is how the Bible describes faith. Look at this picture. That's a mustard seed. So without faith, we can't even please God. We can't make God happy. But the Bible says of that faith right there, that speck, that little dot of a seed, that, that if our faith is just that size, it will be able to move a mountain. You see the significance of what I'm about to tell you now is that you can't please God apart from faith, and if you just have the faith the size of that little speck of a seed, you can move a mountain. Now, people are sitting there, and, and, and they don't think that God really means that. I was researching and wondering what, how people understand that a faith of a mustard seed can move a mountain, because we don't really go around moving mountains too much, do we? No. But, but people will kind of say, ah, it's, it's, it's a figure of speech. But I'm here to tell you it's not a figure of speech. How do I know it? Because from how God's moved throughout history, faith can move a mountain. In fact, when you think about um, Moses, and, and he's up against the sea, and the Egyptians are coming, what does Moses do? He, he raises his rod, and those seas split. Now, I'm here to tell you, why does Moses do anything? Why is he raising that rod? What's he doing? He's actually coming before that water in faith. You see, we're always giving God the glory and the credit for, for what takes place there, and God is the one that does it, and he does get the credit. But you've got to understand, Moses has to have the courage, and he's got to have the faith that he's standing in front of that water, and that when he raises that rod, something that you can't even imagine is going to take place, and that sea's going to split, and the people are going to be able to walk on dry land. Let me ask you, what laser, what bomb, what nuclear weapon, what in, in, in all of humanity's technology has the power to split water like that? Nothing. But faith can, and it did. You know, Jesus rose, you know, raised people from the dead. But not only did Jesus, but his disciples raised people from the dead. What do we have, what weapon, what technology do we have that is able to bring people back from the dead? Nothing. So I'm here to tell you that in, in, in the spiritual realm and in the physical realm, there's nothing more powerful than faith. You'll hear stories that people, you know, were being held up by someone and they push, pulled the trigger of the gun. You know what? Faith has the power to make that gun not fire. You'll hear in war of a bomb that fell and it didn't explode. Faith has the power to keep that from happening. You know what's the craziest thing about faith? And it's something that I'm, I'm, I'm leaning in on and, and learning more and more. It's that faith has the power to change hearts and minds. So even the one who would launch that nuclear weapon or do this or do that through faith, through prayer, God can, it's, he's stronger than all of it. Faith is stronger than all of it. What is faith? 
it's simply believing in, in that which can't be seen. You know, we can't see oxygen, but we know it exists because remove the oxygen from a room and it doesn't work out real well. You can't see wind and air and stuff like that. I mean, don't get me wrong, you can see like trees like blowing, you can see grass blowing, and you can see like stuff floating through, but you're not seeing the wind. You're not, you, what you're seeing is the, the effects of the wind. And so what faith is, is that God exists, and at times in our lives, we experience certain things that we understand and we believe to be God, even though we can't see Him. The Bible says you can't see God and live, right? But we have faith that there is a God. Why? Because we've seen miracles, at least many of us have. We read about them in the Bible, but I'm here to tell you, I don't know if you have, but I'm here to tell you, I have, and I know people who have. I can tell you that I've experienced God not like daily, a handful of times, but I've, I've experienced God's voice in my life, hearing God speak to me. And I'm here to tell you it's not like, you know, some like external voice that's coming through, and it's not just some internal feeling. I can't even describe it to you. It's something in between where you, it's more than a feeling, but it's not like audibly coming through your ears. It, it's a voice that you're hearing, but you're hearing it in your whole soul, in your whole mind, in your whole body. It's crazy, but that's what faith is. You know, faith is not only experiencing God through uh, miracles and hearing His voice, but um, many of us have had those times in which we're just kind of curled up in a ball. And we're hurting. And we're praying or crying out to God, and then suddenly you just feel that, that warmth, that peace, something being lifted from you. You can't see God, but by faith we know He exists. Why is faith important? Faith is important because you can't please God apart from faith. Um, you can't be saved apart from faith. But ultimately, um, Faith honors God, and so God honors faith. Because it's, it's by our faith in God that we show God, you know what, God, I, I believe in you. You know, God, I, I trust you. I mean, I, I, I know, like, none of this makes sense, but I'm going to trust you anyways. God, I, I love you. You know, we, um, we speak of, like, having faith and not having faith, but it's not that simple. Because first of all, there's a difference between knowledge of God and faith, and so that we've got to understand there's a category called not faith. I mean, knowledge of God. The Bible says not everyone who says, uh, you know, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So there's that knowledge of God, but it's not faith. But then we, we also see that there's weak faith, and Jesus, we know there's weak faith because Jesus corrects people for their weak faith. And then there's like exceeding faith or in strong faith and great faith. How do we know that? Because Jesus compliments people on, on their great faith. And, 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 and you know what? It just goes to reason. If there's weak faith and there's great faith, there's probably ordinary faith. It's just you don't hear Jesus say all the time, you got some ordinary faith, right? That's, it's, you don't talk about that. So what are these different levels of faith and, and how do they look like in our lives? You know, the interesting thing is, is you know, God's hardest on believers. Jesus, when he walked this earth, he was hardest on, on, on the religious leaders and honestly his disciples. And you know what? That's to be expected because you know what the Bible says is to whom much is given, much is what? Expected. So there's a story in the Bible in Matthew chapter 8, um, a story that certainly would have freaked us all out, and Jesus um, scolds his disciples for their lack of faith. Look at Matthew chapter 8, 23 to 27. Now Jesus got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. And suddenly a furious storm comes up on the lake so that the waves are, are sweeping over the boat. Now, even though this is all going on, what's, Jesus is actually sleeping in the boat. Now, the disciples go, and they, they wake Jesus up. Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Now, he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? 
And then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves, and it got completely calm. And the men were amazed. What kind of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? I want to ask you, where did the disciples mess up? The wind kicks up, waves are coming over, it, it looks like they're going to die. You know, they're not embracing, you know, in the, in the middle, just, you know, whatever. You know, what, they're going to Jesus, and they're waking Him up, and they're saying, save us. Isn't that what, what our pastors tell us to do? Like, you know, when you're afraid, when this goes on, when, when you're in the storms, you know, cry out to Jesus, turn to Jesus. That's what they did. And this is an example of weak faith. What did they do that's wrong? Because if it's wrong for them, we're doing it wrong all the time too when we cry out to Jesus. The only thing that we can see is wrong it's not that they turned to him. It's not that, you know, they expected that Jesus had the power to save them and is asking Jesus. I mean, they're, I've probably been jumping off the boat and, and just taking my chances bobbing in the waves, right? They're not doing that. They're, they're crying out to Jesus, but this is what Jesus' problem is. He said, you have a little faith. Why are you so afraid? It's their fear That is a sign of their lack of faith. We could talk uh, about this a little bit more, but why is that? Because faith and fear, th they can't coexist. So it's good that they cry out to Jesus, but they should be calling out to Jesus in faith and confidence and certainty in what He's going to do, not in fear. And so here's, here's, the, here's what we've got to wrestle with. To whom much is given, much is expected. We've been given a lot. We're followers of faith. We've grown up in the church. We believe in God. But how many of us are spending our time in fear crying out to Jesus about the different things of our lives when what He really wants for us is to turn to Him in faith? so much fear, so much fear in the world today. I think we're starting to come out of it a little bit now. I have to tell you, like, I, I was at the grocery store on Friday, and, you know, grocery stores are always kind of interesting. You know, you got those who wear a mask and those who don't, and the people who don't, you know, you're kind of staring down those who do, those who do kind of staring down those who don't. Do you talk to the mask people? Do the mask people talk to the unmasked people? I, I try to smile and talk to everyone. I don't know if the mask people smile back because you can't see, right? But, but, but here's, I had this experience, and, and I was coming down the aisle, and, and I sensed from this couple, they're a little anxious about me coming, and, 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 and so I passed the wife with the cart, and, 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 and I said hi and whatever, and then when I got to the guy, I, I, I moved over as far as I could in the, in the aisle, and, and I said, excuse me, and the guy literally does this to me when I say excuse me, as he does that, and he puts his head into the chicken noodle soup. Guys, I, I know that there's fear, but you got to understand that's not how you get coronavirus. And we're not called to live in that kind of fear. Re don't trust me. Research it. A any serious, like, doctor or, or, or um, uh, someone that deals with deadly diseases, they're going to tell you that you have to be within a six-foot radius of someone for 15 to 20 minutes to get a viral dose that's going to make you sick. You're not going to get sick walking by someone. You're not going to get sick walking down the street. But we're living in this fear. And, and this fear is rampant, not just in this country, but every country, not just amongst non-Christians, but Christians. Everyone, we were, we're just, we're afraid. But you know what? In the pandemic, turn to Jesus, not in fear, but in confidence. You know, so much job loss, right? I know a bunch of you are getting called back and stuff like that, and praise God for that. And I just heard a story of uh, early service. The one just got a job, and the other one that looked like it was going to end, and, and they just got a new assignment for two months. And praise God that this stuff's going on. But the question is, is are, are you going to freak out about it? Are you going to be like those disciples and, and cry out in fear to Jesus? I, I mean, it's good. We need to turn to Jesus. But we got to learn to be able to turn to Jesus in faith and not fear. 
You lose a parent, you use a loved one, a breakup of a relationship. I'm telling you, these things can just rock your world. And you're going to need to turn to Jesus, but you need to be able to turn to Him in faith that, that Jesus will get you through it and not in fear. You know, rioting and, and everything that's going on with that. And uh, I, I have to tell you, you know, another story with that. So, I don't know what day it was, but it was back, it was earlier in the week when a lot of the protests were, were violent and so forth. And so, a word came that, um, you know, they're going to be in Alliance Town Center and businesses were being to, told to close and close now. And then they're going to uh, be uh, at one of these 7-Elevens and, you know, it's like, oh man, they're going to come to the police station right across from the church. And I had already gone home uh, that day a little bit early. I think I was swimming laps or doing something and I'm getting texts about all this about to go down. And I'm like, man, I can't leave Joe up here to die by himself. And I have to tell you, I just get to points in my life, it's like, you know what, let it happen, right? And so, and I've been there lately. And, and, and so, I, I'm like, all right, I got to go to church. I got to get up there. I just want to protect the property, make sure everything's okay or whatever. And I went and grabbed my gun, and I started putting it in my, you know, in my back of my pants. And yes, pastor has a few guns. But then I'm like, you know what? I don't need, and the church doesn't need, like headlines of pastors shooting angry protesters from church porch. It just, it just won't look good on the church, me or God. I'm like, you know what, I'll, I'll take a butt kicking for the Lord. You know what, even if I get beat up to the point of my own life, it, that, that could be a good thing, right? And, and I left the gun at home. We can have concerns, but we got to turn to Jesus in faith and not fear. You know, sometimes you'll wake up in the morning and you swear Satan's been doing like flips on your chest and in your head and you're waking up with all kinds of panic and anxiety and struggles and depression and whatever else. How are you going to handle it? Are you going to turn to the bottle? Are you going to uh, turn to just different things to take your mind off it? Are, are you going to turn to Jesus just an utter mess and fear? Are you going to are you going to turn to him in faith? God wants us to turn to him in faith. So that's the example of, of what weak faith looks like when fear, even turning to Jesus in, in complete fear, um, it's, it's not what God's desire is for us. But Jesus also gives an example of great faith. Now, the interesting thing is, is God's kind of hard on believers but he seems to be a little bit more appreciative of and, and loving and forgiving of unbelievers. Why is that? Well, to whom much is given, much is expected. To whom nothing is given, not much is expected. But look at the story from Matthew chapter 8. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came and pleaded with him, Lord, my, my servant lies at home, and he's paralyzed in terrible agony. And Jesus, surprisingly, because normally when they're non-Jews, Jesus kind of gives them a run around. He puts roadblocks in front of them to, to really challenge their faith. Um, Jesus t says to this centurion, he says, I'll go, I'll go right now, and we'll, we'll go heal him. The centurion answered, Lord, I'm, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I, I'm a person that's under authority, and I have soldiers that are under me. I'll tell one to go, and he goes, and another to come, and he comes. I tell my servant to do something, and he does it. Now, when Jesus heard this, he marveled, and he said to those that were following him, truly I tell you, in all of Israel, I haven't found faith like this. And then Jesus goes, and he says to the centurion, go as you have believed, for it will be done to you. And the centurion's servant was healed at that very hour. I told, told you why the disciples are being chastised for their lack of faith. Why is Jesus elevating that this is such great faith? There's at least two reasons. The first is this. The centurion didn't need a prop. You see, we need props. 
For us to understand God's doing something, you know, Jesus, when He's doing a miracle, there's a reason why He spits in dirt and makes mud out of it and puts it as a paste because everyone's like, oh, He just healed him. There's a reason why Moses raises that rod over the sea. There's nothing about that rod that's going to open the sea. There's nothing magical about that. But people, when they see that and they see this, they're like, oh, he just did it. We have water and baptism so that we understand, oh, washing. We have bread and wine in the Lord's Supper so that we can understand, oh, body and blood. We need the physical to grasp the the mystical, to grasp the miraculous, to understand what God's doing. And this non-Jew, probably non-real believer, didn't need that at all. Then the other thing that's remarkable about his faith is that where the disciples have seen miracle upon miracle upon miracle upon miracle of what Jesus did, yet they were still afraid in that boat. This guy hasn't seen any of them. Oh, he's heard stories of Jesus, and now he goes up and asks Jesus for this favor, for this miracle, but he hasn't seen one of them, but yet he believes that over 30 miles, 10 miles, whatever the distance was from that, where that centurion was to his house, that his servant would be healed. You know, there's so many examples of, of great faith in the Bible. I, I swear I would love to do like a 30-week sermon series on just story after story after story of amazing faith because it's incredible some of the stuff that people did in the Bible in the name of faith. You know, let's start from the beginning. I mean, have you, have you, have you thought about Noah? You know, we talk about that story as, you know, just, but first of all, the word of the Lord comes to Noah. Now, what does that look like? What does that sound like? You know, we can't see God and and live, so, you know, was it this disembodied voice from heaven? Noah. Noah. Probably not. I mean, when God does speak that way, we kind of are told he does. There's Moses in the burning bush, and, and, and the voice called out from the bush. Okay, so that can happen, this external voice. But so oftentimes, when the word of the Lord comes to the prophets or to different people, we're not told how it happened. And it's probably how I described it when I told you how I've experienced God in my life. It's not this external voice that's coming down. It's not a feeling. It's somehow his voice, his words are manifested within your heart, mind, and soul and body, you hear it, even though it it didn't really come from the outside. I can't explain it. But Noah has that happen, and now for the next hundred years, Noah's out there building a boat. You know, he's out there day in and day out. He's hammering and he's smashing his finger. But you know what? It may not have even rained yet at that point. So God's telling Noah, I want you to go out and build a boat. It takes him 100 years to do it. What's he doing for his job? How's he farming and getting food? Is this like a side gig? You know, is he doing it after hours? Is his wife nagging on him because she's, you know, he's not like providing food. They're all having to eat berries for 100 years. Imagine what that's like. And it probably hadn't even rained yet, and this flood's going to… I'm telling you, 37 days into this, I'd be like, did I hear God? Maybe I just imagined this. But for a hundred years, he does it. Think about Abraham. He's 80, and God says, you're going to have a kid. And Abraham's got to wait 20 years for that to happen. He was already past the ability, you know, where he would be having kids. He's already too old to be a parent. He's got to wait another 20 years beyond that. He finally gets a kid, and when that kid's 13 years old, God says, oh, by the way, kill him. I have to tell you, like, I, I do think that, like, faith is, is something that God has just really developed in me, and, and it is one of, my, one of my spiritual strengths. And I always like to take any story in the Bible and say, you know, what would you do, Greg? Would, would you be able to, how would you have handled this? You know, and it, I've, never, I've never in my mind been able to get where Abraham was. I don't think I could. And then... And if you don't know how that story goes, Abraham's willing to sacrifice his son, and just before he's able to do it, God says, thanks, I just wanted to make sure you would, and he provided a different sacrifice. 
There's Shadrach, there's Meshach, and there's Abednego, and, and King Nebuchadnezzar builds this, like, huge image, and all they got to do, all they got to do is bow down and, and worship this image, and, and it's going to be okay, but, but they refuse because that's not what a person of faith would do. The king says, you know what? Bow down or you're going to be thrown in this fiery furnace, and let's see if your God's going to save you. And you know what? I appreciate about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're like, God will save us, but this is my favorite thing. But even if he doesn't, they say that. But even if he doesn't, he's going to, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to do it. The furnace gets heated up seven times hotter, ten times hotter, I can't remember. It's so hot that when the doors of it are open, the guards that are to throw them in die instantly. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fall in the f furnace, and all of a sudden there's a fourth person walking around in there. They're not dying. Crazy stuff. Faith. The story of Daniel and the lion's den, and, you know, the, the king is duped by one of his advisors to issue a decree that no one's prayed to other than the, than the king. You know, the kings were seen as kind of like gods, and, and Daniel refused to obey that order, and so he continues for the 30 days that only prayers are offered for the king. Daniel's still offering them to God. He's not doing it in secret. He's got his windows open while he's doing it. King loved Daniel, but you know what? His word is his word. Daniel, sorry, going to have to throw you in the lion's den. Daniel spends the night in the lion's den. Bible doesn't say this, but he's licked by the lions. A little lion kissing. They didn't eat him. The next morning, king's delighted to see Daniel's okay. They pull Daniel out. He throw, the king throws in the people that accused Daniel before their feet hit the ground. They were devoured. Faith is crazy, freaky stuff. It's only by faith that we can please God. Faith is the most powerful force in the universe next to God himself. Faith is different than knowledge. And faith is, is only really developed in, in adversity, in hurt, in pain, and in suffering. I'm here to tell you that when you've built that ark for a hundred years and it finally does rain and you've lived on that boat for a year bobbing in the water and then you finally get off that boat, you will never be the same. I'm here to tell you that when you are willing to take your son and lift up that, 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 that knife in order to sacrifice your, your one and only son who's the world to you because God has told you to do it, it doesn't make sense, but I'm going to follow you in faith to have God say, stop, don't do it, and provide another sacrifice. Do you think there's anything in Abraham's life that intimidated him after that? Do you think that being thrown in a fiery furnace and coming out of there and not smelling flames on your clothes, they were never the same person again and haven't been thrown in a lion's den? And only licked by the lions, you will never be the same. Don't fall for this prosperity gospel stuff that we preachers like to shove down y'all's throats. Oh, you know, if you have faith, everything's going to, you know, turn out great and, and God's going to always give you those blessings and, and life's going to be just wonderful. No, faith is about following God in adversity and showing your trust and your love for God in no matter what it is that you're going through. You know, Paul was beaten to the point of death multiple times over. He was shipwrecked and almost died. Paul almost died multiple times, but people came around Paul. One time he was like dead laying there. They came around him and they prayed for him, and he like sprung back up to life. And, and this didn't happen so that Paul then would go and live the luxurious life or the comfortable life. This was so that Paul would go and die somewhere else, die somewhere better, die before the emperor in Rome so that Christ could be proclaimed there. That's what faith is about. Peter, I'm in the upcoming message series, I'm going to love to tell this story, but Peter's imprisoned and he's about to be put to death. And so some of Peter's friends are, are at their house and they're praying for Peter that God would spring Peter, that God would rescue Peter because he's set to die like the next day. And sure enough, like this angel comes. Peter doesn't even think it's an angel. He thinks it's a vision. But this angel comes and, you know, leads Peter out of the, the prison. 
Peter goes to the, the, the house where, you know, these people are gathered. They're currently praying that God would release Peter. Peter shows up. Someone goes and, you know, there's a knock at the door. They're looking at the door, and they're like, Peter's here. And they're like, Peter can't be here. He's about to die. It must be his spirit. It must be his ghost. Maybe they killed him already. <laughs> We talk about faith, they're praying for something that they don't even believe could happen, and, and, and Peter's there and he's alive, but he's not there and he's not alive because he's going to you know, live in some like palace, be the first pope of, uh, of, of the Roman church and have everything in his life, just go comfortable, whatever. No, it's so that Peter can die at a different place in a different time and, and bring glory to God through that. That is what God calls for us to do, to live in faith. I have to tell you, man, I struggle. I struggle with, with what I've seen over the last several months when it comes to Christians and faith. You know, we've been so, we've been so interconnected with the world that what the world does, we do. Movies we watch, you know, whatever. I say it all the time. Things that we do. And I have to tell you, like, I've literally, like, thought, you know, if I was closer to my, I was closer to my retirement age, I, I, I think once, like, we were, like, through this year or through this coronavirus stuff completely and now, like, civil unrest or whatever else might come, you know, I, I think I'd just walk away and be done. And I'm really there because, I, honestly, like, I'm, just, I, I'm partly like just disappointed in the church. Because far too long we pastors have just spoken about faith as knowledge of God, and it's not that. It has nothing to do with knowledge of God. It might start with knowing of Him. But faith is what pleases God, and faith has amazing power, and it's completely different than knowledge. And here's what I'm tasked with. In a day and age in which everyone is living in such high fear, hatred, anxiety, um, just all these different things, if I truly love the church, if I truly love my members, I've got to be able to say, you know what? I'm worried about your salvation because I know you've got knowledge of, of, of God, but I'm not sure you've got faith because they're different. Because I, I think if, if we had faith, we'd be acting differently during these times. Because faith isn't seen during the ordinary times. Faith is seen during the extraordinary times. And so I'm challenged with one hand, I'm going to have to answer before God that if Christians are acting like the same as non-Christians with everything that's going on in the world today, I've got to answer to God why I, I mistaught them, why I allowed them to be fooled. And I have to tell you, that's a responsibility I, I don't rejoice in. But you know what? I've got it on the other end, too, because you know what? There's people who do have, you know, faith and saving faith, and I can't speak in a way that I cause them to doubt that they do. Now, let me ask you, how do I handle that in the world in which we live today? How do I faithfully love those that, that I don't want to see be fooled thinking they're going to heaven when they're not. Jesus himself says, no one who sa not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, uh, that, that it's, on it, it's only those who do the will of my Father that will be saved, that we take that for real. How, how do I lovingly reach them and encourage them to, to walk in faith and to live in faith, and how do I do it in a way that I don't cause people who have faith to question theirs? It's not easy. And living by faith has never been easy. And that's what I need you guys to understand. You know, um, I've mentioned before in the early days of, of Rome, actually in the, la the latter days of Rome, as Rome is kind of decaying, as if Rome's falling apart, Christianity's flourishing. And why is that? Well, because a lot of difficulties came, plagues came, and different things came. And you know what? The Christians weren't at home with the unbelievers. The unbelievers are sheltering in place because it's the unbelievers that are always worried about protecting their life. But you know what the Christians were doing? Read about it. It's historically documented. The Christians were there. They were putting, they, they didn't have like 
antibiotics and all these different things to do, but the Christians would go and they would tend to people's wounds. They would bandage them. They put their lives in risk. They would give water to, to people who were otherwise lying on the streets, dying of thirst. they give food to people who were otherwise dying because they weren't eating. And people were recovering because the Christians were ministering to them. And you know what? Here's also what's crazy. Research this too, that it was generally understood that the Christians died far less from those plagues than anyone else. Why? Because faith is crazy. Faith is powerful, and faith doesn't make sense. How different is that than how Christians are behaving and acting today? Do you want to see another example of what amazing faith looks like? I mean, if you really think about the significance of that, it can bring you to tears. Row after row after row and after row of crosses of people who gave their life for this country. Some of those people had crazy, unshakable faith, and they thought a bullet that hit their head wasn't going to make it explode. But then there was all those that said, but even if it does, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even if it does, it's not going to change what I'm going to do because I'm going to live by faith, not by sight. You see, we all want to live by sight. We all want it to be orderly. We all want it to make sense, but God doesn't call for us to live by sight. He calls for us to live by faith. A couple of last things I want to say about faith. You know, faith and fear, they don't, they don't coexist. You know, fire and, uh, and water don't coexist. If you've if, if you got too much fire, then give it some water. The water will extinguish the fire. Faith and fear, look in the Bible, read in the Bible. Give me an example in which faith and fear coexist. It's what Jesus is, is getting on his disciples for. You should turn to me, but turn to me in faith, which is different than turning to me in fear. And so I, I get, I, I, I'm not saying that if you have fears, you're, you're not a person of faith. Listen, we're, we're all broken. We're all sinful. We're all messed up. I struggle with, you know, with fear and different things. But, but where, where we're struggling in fear, we've got to pray that God would strengthen our faith in that, that by strengthening our faith, we would be able to, to not deal with what we're dealing with in fear. Look at what David says in Psalm 56, 3 to 4. David says this, when I'm afraid, what does he do? I put my trust in God, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust, and in God I'm not afraid. What can people do to me? That's what we need to do when, when we're struggling with fear, when we're struggling with worries, when we're struggling with anxieties. You're not, your faith isn't where it needs to be. We need to lean into God. We need to trust in God. That's what Jesus did when he was arrested, uh, or actually before he was arrested, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. People are like, he's wrestling with God. No, he, He's afraid. But what's he doing? He's doing what, what David did. When I'm afraid, I, I put my trust in you. When I'm afraid, I turn to God. So Jesus is praying to the Father if there's any other way. And he did it three different times, but in the end he says, not my will, but your will be done. And in courage and in confidence and unshakable faith, he goes forth and, and ultimately sacrifices his life for you and I. Faith and fear do not coexist. And then this is one that I... I need you guys to understand because we, we just don't talk about it all in the church. And that is faith and comfort don't coexist. All of us in here want that comfortable life. All of us are taught that, that, that if you have faith, you're going to receive the blessings of God and, 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 and the, the end result of faith is just all this good that's going to come your way. But, but blessings aren't a good thing in terms of faith because faith grows by adversity and by challenge. A weightlifter becomes stronger not like taking it easy, but by pushing himself. A, a runner becomes a, a better runner not by like walking around the track, but running and running farther than what they're going to do in a race. It's by being stretched that we become stronger. It's, it's by adversity, not comfort, that, 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 that our faith is going to be strengthened. Look at Hebrews 11. In Hebrews 11, there's a whole list of people who are, who are praised by God for their faith. And I'm here to tell you, not one of them in Hebrews 11 had an easy life or a simple life. Did Noah have an easy and simple life? Absolutely, he did not. He built that ark for 100 years. He had his wife telling him he was crazy. You know, there's everything about that that was just 
horrible and miserable. Did, did Moses have an easy life? No. Did Elijah have an easy life? No. Did Abraham have an easy life? No. There's not a person who's commended for faith, and that's the only thing that pleases God, that had an easy life. So why are you looking for that? How do we develop a crazy, radical, and unshakable faith? Um, you, you've got you to encounter the living God. You know, look, look at the disciples of, of Jesus. When Jesus went to the cross, what are they doing? Scripture tells us that they are sheltering in place, in a home, doors locked, windows down, protecting themselves from those who might come and arrest them. But something happens. These same people that are literally hiding in their homes because they don't want to lose their life, all of these people boldly go out before crowds, before riots, and are stoned. They, they boldly go before the, the Roman emperor and other people of high officials and, 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 and religious authorities, and they all die gruesome deaths. How do you go from being locked up in fear, sheltering a place in your house, to, to willfully going and in, in, in seeking death out for the glory of God? They, they did that because they saw the risen Lord. And when you encounter the living God, you will never be the same. And so for all of us in here this morning, my prayer for you is that you would encounter the living God, which is different than just knowing Him. That your life would be radically transformed to know that He is God in heaven. He's living. He's reigning on this earth. He's reigning in your life. And He calls for you to do something that is very difficult, to take up your cross, to take up an instrument of death, and to follow Him, and to not be afraid about it. My prayer is that God would strengthen your faith. My prayer is that God would stretch you. My prayer is that you would not look for the comfortable road and the easy road. My prayer is that, that God would use this time of pruning, and I believe that we're in a time of pruning, that God would use this time of pruning to prune His church, that, that the trials and the struggles would not stop, but that they would be multiplied so that the church would be stronger and the church would be victorious and, and that the church would be back to doing what the church would, should be doing. But my prayer is also that He does it to you and in your life because we need pruning too. Because Christianity has become soft, the church has become soft, and all of us have become soft because what we've pursued in our lives is comfort, peace, tranquility, an easy life rather than a life of following a God who says, if you want to follow me, you've got to be willing to be homeless. If you want to follow me, you've got to be willing to not be able to say goodbye to your mother and father, to not bury bury your father who's just died. For any of you who are struggling with the words that I've said today, and I know this is tough stuff, I'm begging you, go home, take two hours, open your Bible, and just read the red letters in the Bible. And you tell me, the red letters, by the way, are the letters of Jesus' words. You tell me if that's what you hear in your church. And you tell me what kind of life Jesus is calling you to. The one that your church is trying to make you feel good about or the one that Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious Almighty God, we just, um, we come to you this morning with hearts of repentance because we're not, we're not living as true Christians always. We're not following you as true Christians. We're, we're wanting the easy life. We're wanting just to enjoy ourselves and, and pleasures and for everything to go nice and simple and to fall into place. We follow those pastors that say, yeah, just be, be obedient to God and He's going he's gonna to level those roads out. He's going he's gonna to make a way for you and it's going to be so easy and it's going to be like 
you know what, God, that's heaven, and we just thank you that you've given us Jesus Christ, and we look forward to being there that someday. But until then, make our path difficult. Make our heart, hearts hurt and, and our, our bodies and bones and spirits break for you. Because, God, apart from faith, we can't please you. You are our God, and we just... We love you. We believe in you. Help us to do more than just know of you, but to have faith and to trust in you. Strengthen us in our faith. Renew this church. Let us stop running around like those that have no faith. But with courage, having been tested by fire, prove ourselves to have unshakable faith so that when those trials come, when Satan is doing gymnastics on our heads and hearts and minds, when we have to stare death in the eye, that we would barely blink. For you are our refuge. You are our hope. And apart from you, we have nothing. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And thank you for the eternal life that we have by faith in him. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with all of you. Amen. We'll see you next week. Wow, what a great message today and what a call to action. It's time for us to be unshakable. If you like today's message, but maybe feel like you need to put some worries to rest before you can really be unshakable yourself, then you might want to take part in a series we did back in March on finding comfort in times of chaos. We've made it easy to connect with those messages using the following link, lotwchurch.org forward slash comfort. Now, whether today was your first visit online with us or your 50th, we're glad you're here. Don't forget to check in online. When you do, you'll have an option to submit comments and prayer requests. You know, everyone's been spread apart for so long. We want to make sure that you have every opportunity to connect with somebody here. So if you've already checked in, then remember you can also submit comments and prayer requests now or throughout the week in the church online box or using our contact us page. Again, thanks for watching. We are so glad to be with you today in spirit. Be well and reach out if you need anything. Remember that it's our prayer this week that you will be unshakable.